This segment of the show is brought to you by the PGA Tour Superstore. See why golfers everywhere are proud to call PGA Tour Superstore their golf pro shop. Visit them online at PGASuperstore.com. Now, back to you, Chris. And now joining me on the French Lick Resort guest line is four-time winner on the PGA Tour, Tim Simpson. Let me give you some more background on Tim. He is from right here in Atlanta, Georgia, played his college golf at the University of Georgia, where he lettered in 1975 and 76. He was an honorable mention All-American back in 1975 and a third-team All-American in 76. He was named a first-team All-SEC player both seasons as well. While at Georgia, Tim won the 1975 Palmetto Intercollegiate Tournament and the 1976 Southern Amateur. He finished 21st in the NCAA Championship in 1975 and 14th in 76, turned pro in 77. He won four times on the PGA Tour at the 1985 Southern Open, the 1989 US F&G Classic, and back-to-back years at the Walt Disney World Oldsmobile Open in 89 and 90. He collected five other professional wins, including five Georgia Opens and the uh, Casherol World Championship over in France. He had two top ten finishes in majors, both coming in 1990 at the U.S. Open and the PGA Championship. He was named the Comeback Player of the Year in 1989. In 1990, he was named the Georgia Professional Athlete of the Year. 2004, he was inducted into the state of Georgia Sports Hall of Fame. 2006, he was inducted into the Georgia State Golf Association Hall of Fame and named Comeback Player of the Year on the Champions Tour. And I'm very honored he is with me here tonight on Next on the Tee. Hey, Tim, thanks for coming on the show. Oh, glad to be here, Chris. How are you? I'm fantastic. How are you, Tim? Well, I'm doing great, but I only have one bar on my phone, so I'm trying to be real still so I don't drop the call. (laughs) (laughs) I appreciate you. So... Tim, I want to start by going back to your time at the University of Georgia. You had a very successful two years there. You got to play alongside Chip Beck, plus you had some other great PGA Tour players there at Georgia right before your time, and and our good friend Alan Miller, plus uh, Bill Kratzer as well. So talk about your time playing at UGA. Oh, it was a lot of fun. And, uh, of course, Chip and I were roommates. Uh, we're, We're still the closest of friends. Uh, we don't get to see each other very often anymore, but we talk on the phone, and uh, we have a very special relationship. Uh, we met, obviously, as freshmen at 18 years old, and um, to, to this day, there has never been one single second of jealousy between either one of us. I mean, uh, when he won his first tournament on tour, we went out the night before at the LA Open. His little brother was caddying for him, Albert, and we went out to dinner. And uh, Chip was very nervous. And I told him, I said, "It's your time. It is your time. You're going to win tomorrow." And uh, I was, <clears throat> I finished kind of middle of the field, and I'm at LAX getting ready to take off. And I, I walk walking down the corridor, and I walk by this bar, and I watch him tap in and win. And I just lost it. I started crying. And wow. he's Chip is one of the finest people God ever put on this earth, and and uh, I mean we we truly love each other like brothers, uh, and we we've, we've had a great, you know, just a phenomenal friendship over forty years. Um, you know, we both had adversity obviously in our lives. Um, you know, he had some issues on on tour, and and. Uh, you know, with his swing and, and clubs and this and that and caused several years of, of poor play. Uh, and, of course, you know, at the peak of my career, after back-to-back years, top ten on the money list, you know, I got Lyme's disease in 1991, and uh, my health spiraled out of control. Uh, I should have retired long before I did, but I just kept kept believing I could somehow still play. But it was just so ravaging on my body, and I developed a tremor in my left hand known as essential tremor. Uh, I describe it as a non-fatal cousin of Parkinson's, although, as you know, it is fatal to your putting and shifting <laughs> having a tremor <laughs> in your hand. But uh, anyway, I retired uh, from the PGA Tour in 97 and and uh, started teaching, and um, I... At the urgings of two college uh, 
players that I was teaching, that it was like I'd go out and I'd still be shaking and I wouldn't have played for two months and I'd take them out and I'd beat them. And they're like, you've got to start playing again. And I'm like, you know, I can't control myself. So they, they wouldn't stop until I said I'd play a few little tournaments. And I injured, I injured my rotator cuff somehow and I had to get an MRI. And this doctor told me, he said, I've been, I've been following you and you're doing okay. And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'll never be any more than 50% of myself because I can't control my shaking in my left hand. And he said, have you ever heard of DVS surgery? And I said, no, sir. What's that? He said, that's deep brain stimulation. And he said, the best doctor in the world is right down the road in Augusta. And so I went to see him and, uh, they promptly scared me to death. And, um, I'm like, you know, I don't, I don't think I want to be your guinea pig drilling in my head and poking stuff down in my brain. But, uh, I, I went back on medicine, uh, which I had taken before, you know, when I was still trying to play, uh, went to all the top neurologists from, from the head of Emory to the head of Tulane to the head of Loma Linda in California. And, um, anyway, I wasn't getting any better and I wanted to try to play. And so I agreed to do the brain surgery. And March 1st, 2005, I had a nine-hour procedure. And um, I have a, a kind of a pacemaker type thing in my upper chest attached to a wire that you can't see. But um, it's under my scalp, and it goes up. And then I have a brain probe that goes down in my brain, and it sends electronic stimulation uh, to the thalamic region of the brain and stop the tremor and uh, – you know, the, the the great thing, Chris, was I was able to make a successful comeback on the Champions Tour. I did everything but win. I had two or three seconds. But I was able, I got so much publicity for the comeback that I was able to help so many people around the world with neurological conditions. And, um, you know, I feel like that, that, that that's a big part of my legacy. You know, it's I was the guy that would never give up, but also in the end, I was able to to help people. And and ironically, uh, in pursuit of getting in better shape, I met the head fitness writer for Golf Digest, played with him in a pro am, and I'm like, come over to the fitness trailer and and show me what the kids on tour are working on now. And they were doing a lot of stuff with the external hip flexors, you know, with the with the hips. Trying, you know, obviously, the quicker you can spin your hips, the quicker you can swing the club head so he showed me some stuff to do and and knowing full well better uh i overdid it i was doing them twice a day and five days later i was warming up in montreal at the champions tour event and i tore my uh my um oh god damn it uh, the muscle that goes from your knee up to your hip um then i, I tore my quadratus lumborum I pulled cartilage off my ribs, and with one swing, my career was over for a second time. So, um, you know, it's it's uh, it's disheartening, and I know God has a plan, but you know, it, it's is not many top ten players that lose their career from you know something physical, but to lose it twice, you know, right? <laughs> kind of put. I, I mean, I'm I'm unlucky, I guess, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> But but to, to that to that end, and there's so much to get into with what you just said. But but you've persevered through a number of different injuries. You've had spinal fusion surgery, but you've come back twice. You talk about lose it twice. You came back twice, and you were comeback player of the year on both tours. Talk about persevering yeah. through all of that. Well, no, nobody ever in my life has called me a quitter. Um, you know, I was just. It was the way I was raised by my mother that you never give up. You never, ever, ever give up. And that's what I've taught young players over the years. You get knocked down, get up and hit them again. You get knocked down again, get back up and hit them again. You just don't quit. And I think that's a, you know, that's a characteristic that all great players have. I mean, look at, look at Tiger. You know, it, it's, I mean, he doesn't need to prove anything, but in his heart, he wants to come back and win and play great again. And um, it's just, um, you know, I have had a lot of tragedy in my life. You know, the funny thing is, and there's not a whole lot of people that know, but I've got, I guess you would call it a cripple left thumb. At seven years old, I severed my left thumb and, and cut the tendon in half. 
and then that would have been like 1962, they, there was no such thing as microsurgery. So they sewed it back up, and I can't bend the top of my left thumb at all. So I had to learn to set the club totally different than everybody else because my wrist, left wrist, wouldn't bend at the top like everybody else. And I, I never looked at it as a as a negative or anything other than I was just going to overcome it. And, you know, history shows me as one of the greatest ball strikers ever. You know, so it's just, you know, I've just overcome a lot of adversities in, in my life. But, you know, that's life. You know, that's, that's, that's just life. I mean, I'm so lucky to have had the great life that I've had. And, and Tim, one other thing before we move on, because I want to talk about some of the victories you had out on tour, but, you know, you, you talked at, at length about the Lyme disease. Jimmy Walker has been dealing with the same. Have you and Jimmy had any conversation about how you were able you know, to deal with what you had to deal with? No, and I'm a little surprised because I knew Jimmy a little bit years ago. Real, really, really class young man. And uh, I'm really quite surprised that he hasn't contacted me. I, I probably should reach out to him through an email or, or just call him and um, just say, hey, I'm here if you if you want any questions uh, answered that, that I might know about. And, you know, I still have people contact me. Uh, oh, my gosh, you just can't imagine how many people over the years have contacted me. And I still have people do it. And I tell them, you know, I'm I'm not an expert. All I can tell you is find a good, really good immune disease specialist, do what they say, and somehow find a way to have a positive mental attitude. Because I'm telling you what, Chris, it ravages your body. And there is no cure. You know, people say, oh, well, I had it one time, you know, and I'm like, no, if if you did have it, you still do, you know. So it uh, – it, it's tough, but, you know, I wake up every day and I put a smile on my face. And, you know, although the older I get, the, the more I regret all the balls I hit. I was kind of V.J. Singh before V.J. I mean, I beat him and beat him and beat him. And uh, 2016, I had three different back surgeries, and uh, they're wanting to do major surgery L4, L5 now. And uh, I just won't let them do it. So, Tim, let's go back to some happier times. Let's talk about the wins you had on tour. And 1985 was a big season for you. You got your first PGA Tour win at the Southern Open Championship down at Callaway Gardens in Columbus, Georgia. You won that tournament by two strokes over Clarence Rose. You opened with back-to-back rounds of 64 to really set the pace in that golf tournament. Talk about what you remember about your first tour victory. Yeah, you know, um, it, it, it sounds cliche, but... Chris, I just I just had an amazing inner peace that week. I just there was never any doubt, there was never any question, there was little to no nervousness. I just it, it it was like I was told it's your time, like I told Chip before he won LA. And uh ironically, Clarence Rose and I are great friends and we partnered together in a team championship for years. Uh, I don't think we ever finished out of the top 10 um because we both made a lot of birdies, but it was it was incredible, and to do it to get my first PGA Tour victory in my home state was uh, was incredible, really incredible. And your second win came in in '89 at the US G Classic. You won that tournament by two strokes over Greg Norman and Hal Sutton. What was it like battling down the stretch against those two guys? Well, it was um, it, it was awesome because I was playing in the last group with Greg, and Greg was number one in the world, and and we were great friends, and and uh, you know you can imagine on the first tee, you know that it's like, you know, with one tour victory from Atlanta, Tim Simpson, and then they read out five minutes of stuff, you know, on Greg, and and uh, off we go, and I tell him going off the first tee. You know, half those tournaments you won were daggum club championships and four balls and, <laughs> and that. <laughs> we're just laughing. But, you know, it was amazing because, you know, Tom Kite and I were the first two players to start working with Bob Rotella. And uh, I want to say about 80, 83. And um, Bob and I had come up with a game plan the night before because my my former wife was not there. So he said, so basically, other than a couple of friends, you got to accept the fact there's going to be about thirty or 40,000 people assuming Greg's going to win. 
And he said, you just got to just stay in your own game, you know, just stay loose. And I did. And we were still tied on, uh, I think it was 13. And he was about one inch inside of me and about a quarter inch off my line. And I got a good read off his putt, and he missed it, and I center cut mine to take the lead. And the it, it, it was like nothing I've ever seen, Chris. The whole gallery flip-flopped. It was like everybody was pulling for me, screaming for me. Then two holes later, uh, on the par five, he knocks it on in two. I lay it up, and I stuff it in there about 10 feet, and uh, – he runs it by about five feet, and I make mine, and he misses his. Now, I got a two-shot lead, and then on 16, I stuck the dagger in his heart where I hit a, I think it was an eight iron from the fairway and hit the pin, almost went in, and uh, and it was pretty much over. But uh, I, but then he gets his revenge on me the next year, the dog. He At, <laughs> at, at Doral, we, we have a four-way playoff with uh, uh, Azinger, Calc, Calcavecchia, me and Greg. And, of course, Greg shoots 64-64 on the weekend to get in a dead gum playoff. Anyway, so we all three hit number one in two. I'm on the back friend, Zinger and Calc are on the green. Greg hits it over the green, and it looked like an elephant stepped on it. It's in five-inch Bermuda. He's dead. And Calc misses, Zinger misses, Greg hits it, and the damn thing runs like a rabbit right in the hole. And wow. I still to this day, every time I see him, I tease him about it. I'm like, don't, don't you even tell me you didn't chunk that ball. You know, you <laughs> mishit it to the luckiest person. And then, of course, my dead gum putt does a 180 and comes back out the front and he gets the trophy. And I'm like, well, you got your revenge. But, uh, <laughs> that, that was probably, probably my biggest thrill because, you know, it was like going head to head you know, eight years ago or so with Tiger. I mean, Greg was number one in the world. He was Superman. Yeah. And, uh, but my two, two Disney wins were fantastic and, and, um, uh, you know, very, very fond memories. Uh, t- tell you a cute story, you know, as, as part of winning, we used to have the Oldsmobile scramble. So as part of the, the winner's check, you also got a new Olds 98 PGA edition. It was, had every option on it you could get. So this was in 89, the first year I win. The, the next tournament is the Tour Championship, and it's at Harbortown. And, of course, you know, we've gone over. I'm in the last group. Anyway, my caddy's buddies, the, the other caddies he's riding up to Hilton Head with, said uh, they left him. And so he's like, I don't have a ride to Hilton Head. So Tom Pond, the executive director uh, with, with Buick, is standing or Oldsmobile is standing there. And he says, well, what's the deal with the car, Mr. Pond? And he said, well, it's Tim's decision. I mean, he can take that one or we can send one to Atlanta or whatever he wants to do. And and Todd says, do you all have the keys to it? And I said, and he said, yeah. Todd got in the car, drove it off the 18th green, down the cart path, right to Harbor Town. <laughs> all he did was put gas in. He drove it off the green, and then he drove it to my house in Atlanta after the tournament. <laughs> and that's how I got the car. And of course, I gave it to my dad. But I thought, <laughs> and Mr. Pine Classic. said, "I've never had, I, I've never had that ass before. <laughs> Can we drive it off the green?" <laughs> that is classic. <laughs> You know, Tim, just one other point about that 89 Disney win, because you you beat a couple of good friends of ours here on the show, and Donnie Hammond and Kenny Knox. And, you know, Zinger was in that, so was Freddie Couples. But curious to understand what what it was like competing against Donnie and Kenny. Um, It it was great. I remember Donnie was ecstatic because – yeah, we were, we were always friends, as as I am with Kenny, and and uh, we Donnie walks into the score tent before we tee off there. We, we're in the last group on Sunday, and Donnie says, um, uh, "Timbo, as long as I finish second, I'll be happy because that'll get me in the tour championship next week." And that that's how we started off the day. And it wasn't a defeatist attitude; it was just, you know, that was his goal to get in the in the tour championship. And uh, he he got what he wanted. <laughs> he finished second. <laughs> Careful what you ask for. That's exactly and, and Tim, right. And Tim, you're teaching the game. 
now. Talk about, you know, how you're going about, you know, teaching, you know, students now, how you motivate them and the things that you do to get the, get young people interested in the game. You know what, Chris, I, I don't promote myself at all. People just have a way of finding me either through the website or word of mouth or what have you. But, you know, in, in, in my whole PGA Tour career, and, and this is not meant as a criticism to my fellow players and friends, but, but I mean, out of a thousand tour players I saw come down the pike over my career, or 800, however many there are, I wouldn't recommend five or ten of them to give you a golf lesson. You know that, in in other words, they were great players, but they couldn't teach. And I'm I'm talking about some Hall of Famers too. They just couldn't teach it. But it's something I've always enjoyed. It's something I've always been able to do. And I think teaching, and I think you would agree, is uh, say 50% knowledge and at least 50% communication. And you know, I'm not into track man and this and that. It's I believe, especially with a good player, when I, when I say a good player, a lower handicap player, which I would say 12 or less handicap, you know, that, that they have feel. And I, I believe, and, and it worked for me my whole career, and I've seen it work for a lot of people, I believe if I can give you a drill at the first swing, you have this aha moment, and you look at me and you say, holy moly, can I feel that? And, and then I say, there you go. Because my argument is, if you can feel it, you can change it. In other words, if I try to baffle you with my knowledge by drawing angles and lines on a computer and saying your plane is off, to me, that's like saying you wrecked your car. You know, it's kind of the obvious. Let's let's get to the bottom of fixing, Chris. You know, and if I can give you a key that you can feel, that you can take on the golf course and immediately hit good shots with, that's what it's all about. And I also believe that, that you know, when I get a, a real advanced player, I mean, a real good college player or a young pro or something, I believe more times than not, I teach a lot like Butch Harmon. And we've always been friends, and I love the way Butch teaches. He's very simplistic. It would shock you how simple he keeps it. And I'm the same way. And my, my thing is, I don't think there's a need to rebuild the whole race car. Let's just change a spark plug. Let's just tweak it here and there, and um, and 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 I've, I've I've been very successful, you know, with with doing that with players, you know. I I just don't make it ultra complicated. Um, I just don't, you know. And the, I think the the you know when a guy was re- recently asked me, he he said, you know, when you were stuffing it in there three feet, it seemed like every other hole. What what were you thinking? your whole career. And it was like, target. They're like, no, no, but you had a swing thought. I mean, you know, turn the shoulders, smooth transition, drive the legs. And it was like, no, you know, it's, I just had for a kid that grew up extremely ADHD. They just didn't know what that was 50 years ago. I learned, I I developed somehow, Chris, and a very acutely intensive level of concentration. The stuff that bothered my, my fellow players, I didn't even hear. And it was like I laser focused my mind on my target and it was going there. And then when I would do exhibitions over the years, you know, I would be hitting balls and I would tell people, you know how important it is to have proper alignment. Well, watch this. And you line up 50 yards left and you hit it right over the flag. Then you line up dead square and hit it over the flag. Then you line up 40 yards right and hit it over the flag. How do you do it? Well, a lot of it's feel and talent, but it's your mind knows where that intended target is. Like a a third baseman that catches a hot shot down the line. You know, he grabs the ball, he steps, steps, and it's not until the microsecond before he releases it that his eyes ever see the first baseman. But he knew where he was the whole time. I think it's it's mental focus, mental focus. And I shoot competition archery now. I shoot traditional archery, which is the hardest of all because there's no sights. I shoot long bows and recurves. And it's, it's the same way. It's you focus on your target and you trust your mind is going to elevate your hand and arm to the proper place to deliver that area, that arrow into a three inch circle at 30 yards. 
you know, and there there are no sites. This isn't compound archery. I mean, this is what the Indians did. And it's the same thing. It's it's focus. It's mental focus. So, Tim, I'm sure you've piqued a lot of our listeners' interest. For those that want to reach out to you that might be interested in getting a lesson for themselves or getting a lesson for their junior player, how can they find you? Uh, they can contact me through my website, timsimpsongolf.com. Uh, I do motivational speaking. I teach, and I can't do corporate outings anymore because I, I haven't been able to play in about 16 months now. I did hit balls uh, two weeks ago, first time I hit a driver in a year. But um, my, my low back's really giving me fits. But, but yeah, they can contact me that way and uh, ig- ignore the, the Twitter and Facebook that's on the website. I don't ever keep up with those. But uh, I have a Tim Simpson personal Facebook account. Uh, they, they can find me that here in Georgia and communicate with me. And uh, I live at Lake Oconee. Um, you've probably heard of Reynolds Plantation, or now it's called Reynolds. Yep. And then next door, the sister community is a fantastic Tom Weiskopf, Jay Marsh course. And that's where I live at Harbor Club. Uh, we were voted number three in the state last year. It's a great golf course. Well, Tim, I have thoroughly enjoyed this time. And, 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 and there's so many other things I'd love to get your thoughts and insights on. I hope you'll come back and join me again sometime. You're fantastic. Oh, I, I would love it. I would love it. I, I lead, uh, Chris, you'd be shocked. I lead a quiet life. I shoot arrows, and I live with my dog. <laughs> you know, I'm just an old bachelor, and I live a quiet life. You know, drive a truck, don't drive a Mercedes. You know, I, I just love comp- competing in archery. And, you know, you mentioned I won the 25 and under world championship in 1981, and that's my goal is I want to win a world championship in traditional archery so I can say I, I won a world championship in two different sports. I think that would be pretty cool. That yeah, would be very cool. Good for you. I hope you do it. And I hope you'll come back and talk all about it because, uh, like I said, I, I, I can't tell you how much fun this last segment of the show has been, and, uh, and I thank you very much for that. Well, call me any time. It, it was my privilege to be on, and uh, I wish everybody a, a wonderful golfing year, and, uh, and and most importantly, enjoy the game. Enjoy the game. I think. Uh, there you go. And and I and, and and I think you know from all my talks with Bob Rotella, I was struggling recently with my archery, and he said, "Timbo, you're you're making it too complicated." He said, "You know, all I can tell you." Whether you're kicking a football, pitching a baseball, hitting a tennis ball, or hitting a golf ball, the more unconscious you can go, the better you'll play. And that's my advice to amateurs. It's not that maybe you're not ha- not having an issue with a you know, hook or you know what have you, and maybe you need a lesson. But when you play, focus on your target and watch the results because your your mind is amazing. There you go. Great advice. Tim, again, thank you for your time. TimSimpsonGolf.com. Folks, go check it out. Tim, hopefully we get the privilege of having you back on the show again real soon. Anytime, Chris. My honor. Ah, thank you, Tim. Take care. All the best to you and your family, my friend. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. See ya. That is Tim Simpson. Again, TimSimpsonGolf.com, four-time winner on the PJ Tour. Boy, that was a lot of fun. Holy cow. Hopefully we get to get Tim back on the show again real soon. 